Professor Schenkin, I have my stopwatch on me, so I promise I won't run over my allotted slot. There is so much um, to say on vitamin D, ladies and gentlemen, that I could take all night <laughs> and you'd still be here by dawn and I wouldn't have finished. So what I, what I want to just do, and in line with good housekeeping, I would just like to declare uh, uh, my in conflicts of interest. Um, I don't see any of them being particularly conflicts, but because I'm talking about vitamin D, particularly in the context, context of COVID-19, um, I have done a little bit of work for uh, the supplement company and also for the Council for, for Responsible Nutrition and have given a couple of webinars and written a media piece for which a royalty was paid and I have donated that both to the University of Surrey Hardship Fund and to the Royal Osteoporosis Society. I've also done some webinars for the Learning Societies of Nutrition Society and Physiological Society and a Guardian podcast for which there's no financial declaration. And as you can see, those are in bold on this slide. Now, what I want to really try to do um, is to take you through vitamin D from beginning to end and to really share with you what vitamin D is, why it's important, where it sits and why there's been so much media debate um, about the importance of vitamin D, both to immune function, but also in terms of, of COVID-19. And I'm going to share with you quite a bit of, of information and I will keep a very careful eye on time and I can always flick over slides if I feel that I'm spent a little bit longer on, on explaining. And what I'd like to finish with is um, are some slides just on practical ways of ensuring vitamin D adequacy and to really bring you the most up-to-date information as it currently stands. So vitamin D, so let's begin at the beginning. So vit vitamin, which is of course used to have an E on the end, so vitamins are all vital amines and amines are of course a chemically composed group for which of course vitamin D is not a vital amine, it's actually a pro-hormone. So it is a misnomer, you know, right from the outset. And it is the only nutrient in the broad spectrum of nutrients where our main source is not one of diet, but actually UV exposure. And that UV exposure has to be at that wavelength as I list there, 290 to 315 nanometers. In the United Kingdom, and of course that would um, absolutely in include Scotland in terms of the UV exposure, but just to bear in mind that on average, it is that we can make vitamin D between April and September, but the evidence coming out, and particularly the work of Professor Anne Webb from the University of Manchester, suggests that the further the northern latitude, so certainly for areas of Glasgow and onwards, it would probably be nearer to May to late August, that would be that, that window when you can make vitamin D. And perhaps we can come back to that in the questions. And so what you will see in this slide is 7D hydrocholesterol. So that is a steroid that sits just under the skin. And then when UV light hits the skin, we then make what's called 25 OHD or 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And that is our clinical marker for vitamin D status. So what do I mean by that is, is if you are concerned about your vitamin D levels, you can go and get your 25 hydroxy vitamin D measured or your 25 OHD me measurement made. And that will tell you about your bodily stores of vitamin D. What makes vitamin D so unique is, of course, is that there is further conversion in the kidney to give us what's called 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the active hormone of vitamin D. And that's very important. And I want to come back to that. This is the slide again shown in a little bit more um, depth. And so you can see here the 70 hydrocholesterol, the UV rays. And then the reason that I've highlighted this is obviously to just point out the importance of 25 and 125 and how they're different, but also to just point out to you at the top there that your body is very clever. You can never become vitamin D toxic through UV exposure. 
And so what I mean by that is that after about 20 to 30 minutes of being in that UV light, you then won't make any more vitamin D for the day because what happens is it goes to pachystriol. And so the body has adapted over, you know, of course, over such, such a long period of time, such that once you have your UV exposure for the day, that's it, you won't make any more. And it's a fail-safe mechanism of toxicity. So you can never, ever become vitamin D toxic through UV exposure. And you only need 20 to 30 minutes of being in that sunlight to make some vitamin D. And if you wear clothing or you're behind a screen or you put on sun cream or ladies put on face moisturizer, that will block out quite a lot of, of the vitamin D manufacture. And perhaps we can, or I'll certainly come back to that. So a useful take home message is make no vitamin D. So it's when your shadow is shorter than your height. So it will start to, to now turn in April. That when you go out and if it's a sunny day, have a look at your height and in on a sunny day in the winter, it will be double your height. And then we know it's to do with what's called the zenith angle of the sun. The sun uh, wavelength um, is such that the sun, of course, drops in the winter. And that's what makes our shadows much longer. And um, this isn't me making this up. This was a real uh, publication by Dr. Holloway in The Lancet many years ago and just purporting to that fact of the importance of your shadow in terms of UV exposure. Now, I can't possibly talk about vitamin D without just saying just a few words about this extraordinary lady, Dame Harriet Chick, who of course was one of the first key scientists that showed the importance of both sunlight and cod liver oil in preventing rickets in children. And of course, I show a slide here of children with rickets. Um, the uh, a little child on uh, the left has not knees and the other child has bandy legs. And that is a softening of the bones. And you can again see that um, uh, in the, the bones slide there, there's a softening of the bones because there is insufficient both vitamin D, but also calcium. So it makes the bones very soft. And of course, cod liver oil was tremendously successful in cutting out um, rickets. It's also very important for osteoporosis prevention. So again, here I show a slide of somebody with healthy vertebrae and then somebody with osteoporotic bone. And then if I just highlighted that in the yellow and blow it up for you, you can see this is osteoporotic bone and then blown up even further. You can see the tremendous trabecular, the bone, uh, trabecular bone or cortical bone, uh, which are our two types of bone that we have in the body. And this tremendous disconnectivity, such the bone is very, becomes very worn away and liable to fracture upon impact. And we know that vitamin D is very important in preventing osteoporosis. We know that vitamin D deficiency is a huge problem not just in this country, but across the world, the WHO estimate that about 2 billion people living um, in low to middle income countries have vitamin D deficiency. And NICE predict that we spend probably in the region of 100 million pounds a year on vitamin D supplementation. Now, if you remember back, I said about the cutoff, or I said about that you can measure in your body, this 25 OHD, 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And then this is a slide that shows you the difference, the different countries who've come up with their guidelines for vitamin D and where they've set the cut point for vitamin D deficiency or vitamin D adequacy. And as Professor Schenkin very kindly said, I do indeed sit on our scientific advisory committee on nutrition. So it's similar to SAGE, but it's a, it's a committee that deals with nutritional issues rather than, than a group on um, emergencies. And we set our cut point at 25 nanomoles per litre. So what we say is that we don't want anybody to be below 25 nanomoles per litre 
for their 25 OHD status, for their vitamin D status. The American, as shown in the orange, set deficiency at 30. And then what they do in their government recommendations is on, are looking at optimal health. So they are trying to achieve 50 nanomoles per litre. And EFSA, the European Food Aid Safety Agency, also set that cut point at 50 nanomoles per litre. And then what you will also see on here in the red is the Endocrine Society. And I show that not because it is a government recommendation, but it is an organisation that believes that we should be much, much higher at 75 nanomoles per litre for optimal health. And I'd like to come back to that because there has been a great deal of controversy as to whether we really need to be at that higher level. What I show in this slide is concomitant with those vitamin D levels. These are the recommendations that have been now been published across the world. And I show there in the purple second, the American DRI, the green and the orange there, New Zealand, the Nordic countries, um, really have all set their recommendations for vitamin D somewhere between 10 micrograms and then slightly higher up to um, 25 micrograms. And we can come back to that perhaps in the questions of, of the controversy and the differences between different countries. Now, right up until 2016, we had no recommendation for vitamin D. And the reason for that is was because it was considered that we made enough vitamin D during this summer, challenged by um, a number of different scientists, indeed, including myself. I wasn't on SACN at that time. I didn't come on to SACN until 2010. And we really challenged the government and said that we felt that their thinking was scientifically in wrong. And we finally, in 2010, we got the green light to run a full risk assessment for vitamin D. So what that means is we then set about reviewing all the evidence to see if we should make a change. And on the 23rd of July, 2016, that was published by Public Health England. And the new recommendation is 10 micrograms per day or 400 international units. One microgram equals 40 international units. And that was a big change for the United Kingdom to go from zero up to 10. And as I highlight here in the purple, this new recommendation represents a very significant challenge, of course, to the United Kingdom because we would achieve no more in, in our diet than about 3.5 micrograms, which is equivalent to about 140 international units per day, because there are so few foods that contain vitamin D. Now, the reason that there's been so much in the media about vitamin D and uh, the immune function is because of the discovery of the vitamin D receptors, or VDRs, as they are known and also vitamin D metabolic enzymes that have been shown to be present in immune cells. And that very much provides the scientific rationale for the importance of vitamin D in maintaining immune homeostasis, and of course, in preventing uh, the development of autoimmune processes. And I show on this slide, and I just highlight here for you in the green, that vitamin D receptor of how important it is in terms of translating and really getting in and working in those immune cells. This is a beautiful review, it's open access. And for any of you who are interested in it, I would encourage a read. It's written by really one of the most world leaders in vitamin D and immune function, Professor Martin Hewison from the University of Birmingham. And indeed, this is the Nutrition Society's most highly cited paper on vitamin D. And he includes some very important references that I just share with you here. They're very busy slides, and I don't have time to go through them in great depth. But I just highlight for you here this very important enzyme, CYP27B1, which is, of course, very important 
in the mechanism of vitamin D and its manufacture and how important that enzyme is in its workings in all of those different cells that I list there, but also in the non-classical functions of vitamin D. This is another very busy slide, but I just want to just highlight to you, and I'm just putting them all up in, in red, all of those these different functions of immune homeostasis require vitamin D activity and that vitamin D receptor. So this is really right down at the cellular level, showing you how important the vitamin D receptor is and how important that active hormone of vitamin D125 is to immune function. Now, when we then put that into uh, the context, what we see is that it's been hypothesized that there is an association between seasonal upper respiratory tract infections and low vitamin D status, because nine times out of 10, both of those occur in the winter. But, and I think this has been borne out so much during the COVID pandemic, that actually our activities when we're indoors, that there's a much greater proximity to individuals, there's much more likely to be interpersonal transmission. And it's not that simple to say, yes, in the winter I'm vitamin D deficient, that must be why I get a cold. That said, the mechanisms are most certainly there. And I do believe that there are many, many people hopefully less now, and, and of course the COVID pandemic has been a very a tragic time for all sorts of reasons, but it has put vitamin D in the spotlight. And I hope it's made people appreciate the importance of that nutrient and the importance of taking a vitamin D supplement during those winter months when you will achieve very little manu or no, virtually no vitamin D manufacture from UV exposure. Now, what we see here um, is this was a very um, good publication. It captured all the media. It was uh, published in the British Medical Journal. It was a systematic review and meta-analysis. So what that means is that pulling together all the different randomized control trials, all the observational studies, looking at vitamin D and immune function. But there, whilst it's, it got into a very good journal and it's uh, achieved a lot in the media, it's very important to point out that that original meta-analysis was very much focused on two trials, one in Mongolia and one in Afghanistan. And we have to be very careful to extrapolate data in developing countries where their characteristics are going to be very different to that in uh, developed countries. I'm, and, and indeed there was a lot of correspondence and uh, a lot of uh, debate by stat statisticians who were very critical of that paper. What has subsequently now, this will be out in the Lancet, um, should be next week. I did speak with uh, Professor Martineau um, last week. It's now been accepted. So this is an updated meta-analysis. And what's very important with this updated meta-analysis is that the um, reliance on the, those two large developing country trials has now gone. It's a much more balanced meta-analysis. And what, what's very interesting is whilst the overall effect size is likely to be overestimated due to publication bias, what's very interesting is that the protection from vitamin D against acute respiratory tract infections was most impressive in doses that were between 400 and 1,000 international units given on a daily basis. And the large bolus doses, which of course have been rife in all the media to say that everybody should be taking huge doses, 10,000, 50,000 international units of vitamin D per day. Those studies that were done looking at those sorts of doses actually didn't work but the results were best and aligned themselves very well indeed to the uh, second recommendations of 400 international units per day. And again, perhaps we can come back to that um, in the questions. Now, when we look at that, this was another meta-analysis that was carried out 
it was different to the Martinu group because it only included healthy individuals and indeed could not find any um, protective effect of vitamin D against acute respiratory tract infections. This was another trial that came out by the New Zealand group, very large trial, used a very high dose of vitamin D. And as you can see there, um, what the study found, the bottom line, and there's an awful lot of detail there, and, and of course, um, I've sent through the slides and I'm very happy for you to have all of them. So you, for those of you who are most interested in the depth and the detail, you can look at that in your own time. But the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, was that it had no effect. That large dose given had no effect. The uh, uh, Professor Martinu's group have published um, just about six months ago now, a new uh, trial. This was carried out in Mongolia. Again, you can see large doses 14,000 international units of vitamin D given weekly. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and again highlighted what the study found. There was no difference in acute respiratory tract infections or tuberculosis infection or disease between the vitamin D and placebo groups given those high doses. Now in the trial that we uh, got some funding for from the government, to look at the effect of diet on vitamin D status to really answer that question that do you if what that which you make in the summer does it last you during the winter and I just show this slide because what's very important so this was you can see on the bottom axis so we measured vitamin D every season for one year the red and the blue bars indicate the pre and post Caucasian women and you can see that they had higher levels during the summer and then this dropped down during the winter. And we also had in the orange and the green bars, South Asian older and younger women. And you can see if you run cast your eyes across, they were below 25 nanomoles per litre for almost the entirety of the year. There has been a great deal of speculation because COVID has been so detrimental to um, ethnic groups, that that again is linked to vitamin D. I, we haven't really explored and got proper answers to that yet, but it is undoubtedly the case that ethnic minority groups are very vitamin D deficient, and they are a group that we really need to focus our attention on. And we've done a lot of work on the UK Biobank, so that is the UK Biobank includes across the UK 500,000 individuals. And we've been very privileged enough to win a grant to be able to look at vitamin D levels in those 500,000, but particularly in uh, South Asians. And this is the largest study that we can find across the world on looking at vitamin D status in South Asians. And you can see in this graph, I just draw the line in blue, where 25 nanomoles per litre sits, which is of course our recommendation of the United Kingdom for deficiency. And you can see for yourself, vitamin D deficiency is almost universal in UK South Asians with over half from 55% of them below 25 nanomoles per litre. And that's not to forget that 10% of the samples were below the detection limit of 10 nanomoles per litre. So there are real deficiency issues. And in a second publication, if you just look at that box that I've shown you there, their intake varied of vitamin D between, um, in the Indian group, one microgram per day, in the Pakistani group, 1.5 micrograms per day, and in the Bangladeshi population, three micrograms per day. So they are really very low indeed. Now it has been purported, and this is a very important study within the realms of vitamin D deficiency and acute respiratory tract infections, because it was carried out in um, African American women. This is the only trial that we have on vitamin D supplementation in a prevention of acute respiratory tract infections. And what the uh, Professor John Aloya did with his group was that they gave a dose of vitamin D to keep the vitamin D group 
above 75 nanomoles per litre, which was really to answer the endocrine society that have been very vocal in the media um, and indeed were very vocal when we published the second report and indeed um, in the publications that I've done and I'm going to share with you on COVID in just a moment, um, have been very vocal to say that we are completely wrong and they people, everybody should be at 75 nanomoles per litre. So this randomised controlled trial was carried out and achieving 75 nanomoles per litre or above in Black African American women and then the placebo group who were much lower than that, there was no difference in the occurrence of acute respiratory tract infections between the two groups. Now, that shares with you the evidence of vitamin D in acute respiratory tract infections. Now, how does it link potentially to COVID? And the two mechanisms are as follows. ACE2, or angiotensin converting enzyme, this is an enzyme that attaches itself to the outer surfaces or the cell membranes of cells in many different organs. ACE2 also lowers blood pressure by catalyzing the hydrolysis of angiotensin II. We know that ACE2 is a key player in the RAS system, the renin-angiotensin system, and its loss of function can have devastating effects. And what we also know, and that is absolutely right, from a mechanistic point of view, vitamin D is a negative regulator of RAS, and that normalization of vitamin D levels can lower RAS activity, um, you know, through, um, through what we would call a transcriptional suppression of renin expression. I'm sorry if that sounds a little technical, but it, I'd just like to share with you the science, just so that you know mechanistically, there is certainly potentially a link. But what we then have to do is to look at the science to see if the science holds up to that. Now, this study, ladies and gentlemen, I remember it very well because um, not only do I sit on SACM, but I was asked to join a working group for the Cabinet Office. And I did a lot of work for them in the early uh, part of COVID, um, interpreting data for them and sharing with them all the mechanisms. And this study came out, it was published on what's called a preprint server. So you can put papers up onto a preprint server before they are then go out to peer review. And it's something that is done a lot. There is a caveat to say that it's not peer reviewed. This paper was put up. Um, I received it from the cabinet office. I sent it to the senior statistician at Surrey. He checked all the stats with me and it looked a very strong paper. You can see in the gold box how many times it's bound down, loaded over 100,000 times. And I'm sorry to say, um, ladies and gentlemen, that I then in last summer shared an afternoon with the editor in chief of the British Journal of Nutrition. This uh, letter was published to say that those authors in this study did not exist and the whole of the study was made up and somebody had planted it in the media to get it across all the newspapers, you know, the Times, the Telegraph, the BBC News, it was everywhere. But that study, and this is the letter, and again, you've got the reference, you can easily pull it up. This letter was written by Indonesian doctors who are based you know, in the location where this study was purported to have done, and the whole thing was made up and planted in the media. So I think that just shows you how cautious that we have to be. And indeed, that preprint server, you can see there the email address. Um, rules have now been changed that no Gmail addresses can now be used. It has to be with an educational institution. And they let this one slip through to the damage, I think, of people seeing that high vitamin D levels were protective against COVID. And it simply isn't the case. It was all made up. So what I did was very early on, um, I pulled together some key names in, in vitamin D um, and who all have different views. And it was like trying to herd cats to get them all to agree to, to, to some wording. But we really wanted to get science 
and sense out there. And so we published in the British Medical Journal, Nutrition Health, Nutrition Prevention and Health, a consensus paper of the evidence that is open access and can easily be downloaded. And as a group, we are now working on a second publication, which we aim to get out again in May, one year on, to say that which we recommended last time, has it changed any difference? And I'm gonna come back to the summary conclusions that we had. But if you look at the trials that have been done on vitamin D and, and COVID, this was um, a very interesting study. This was a Swiss study. And again, it's a very busy slide and I don't have time to go through it in great detail. But this trial showed lower vitamin D levels in those um, uh, that were aged over 70 years who'd had a positive COVID test. But it's very important to bear in mind that vitamin D is a negative acute phase reactor. So if somebody is unwell, it will the levels will fall. And that is something that many people, especially those writing the media, don't always appreciate with vitamin D. This was a trial. Now, I think the evidence for, of course, we need randomized controlled trials. This is the most promising study. This is a pilot study. We're now waiting for the main study to be published. And it was uh, carried out in Spain where they uh, allocated uh, hospital patients who had COVID with a very high dose of vitamin uh, D. Now, what I would say, it's a very, very high dose of vitamin D. What was um, rather a shame, although that they were randomized, the groups who, were, um, who had COVID and who didn't have COVID were not exactly matched. And indeed, those who didn't have COVID had a different blood pressure level and, and some other health outcomes that were slightly different. So whilst it demonstrated a, a significantly reduced need for ICU treatment of patients requiring hospitalization with COVID-19, it in no way is proven cause and effect because there were differences in the groups. Very interestingly, this study was a pilot study. A larger trial was published and indeed was put up last week onto the preprint server, but it was taken down after a lot of complaints to say that the data did not stand up to scrutiny. So further analysis is, is being done on that. And so we watch this um, space. For those of you who are particularly interested in, in this topic, I would encourage you to look at these reviews. So we, as a second panel, published um, a two reports, so one in June and one in December, looking at the link between vitamin D and acute respiratory tract infections. And we felt in June that there was not enough evidence to make a recommendation for vitamin D and prevention of acute respiratory tract infections. But in December, with a larger number of trials and a new meta-analysis that was not dependent on developing countries, we were happy to change that recommendation. So the vitamin D, um, as a second panel, now says that it may be important in, in preventing acute respiratory tract infections. We also, as a second panel, and indeed I was asked to review for NICE, their two reports on vitamin D for COVID treatment and prevention, both in June and then again in December, and the evidence we didn't feel stood up to scrutiny and that we could not make any recommendation for vitamin D either as a preventative or as a treatment strategy for COVID-19. And those reports are all downloadable for free from the NICE and the SACAN websites and make for you know, a very extensive read. And they were announced, the new reports that we did uh, were announced by the Secretary of State on the 18th of December. And we are continuing to keep a watching brief on any further information. Now, when you're all thinking about, and, and I've, Mr. Chairman, I've got my stopwatch on me, so I'm keeping a very careful eye on, on where I am, and I estimate that I think I've got about another 10 minutes 
or so. Is that right, Professor Schenken? Is that what you predict? Yes, our, our, our 15. 15, lovely, thank you very much. So you're all thinking, okay, so vitamin D is important. And as Professor Schenken said in, uh, in his introduction, we should really try to achieve a good nutrition through a balanced diet. And as a registered public health nutritionist myself, I don't agree with popping pills. I think there are exceptions in different places. For example, folate for women who are trying to conceive would be a good example. But also for vitamin D, that during the winter, our recommendation as a second panel in 2016 was that everybody should take a vitamin D supplement during the winter months to just keep those levels stopping from dropping below 25 nanomoles per litre. And 10 micrograms will achieve that for 97.5% of the population. That then lends itself to the question, okay, if I'm going to take vitamin D, should I take D2, which is the plant source, or D3, which is the animal source? And this was something that I'd followed in the literature quite a lot. And all the literature up until uh, 2000, about 2009, 2010, most of the literature said that it didn't matter which form of vitamin D you used, D2 or D3, you would see the same change in vitamin D status. And so I wrote a grant again to the government, this time not to the Food Standards Agency, but to the a biological and Biotechnology uh, Sciences Research Council, BBSRC, to really address the difference between D2 and D3. And so I submitted my grant, and as luck would have it, this paper got published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition by Professor Mike Hollick, who's a huge name in vitamin D. He's done so much in the vitamin D field, indeed, wrote the Endocrine Society guidelines to say that we should be at 75 nanomoles per litre. And I've followed much of his work as a, as a doctorate student, and he's won many awards for it. And he published with his team a study that was exactly what we had written in our grant application, which was to look at D2 versus D3 in an orange juice. And what he said in that publication was that there was no difference and that giving the animal or the plant form made no difference to your vitamin D status. When I saw that, I was thinking, oh, well, let's hope the reviewers of the grant don't see it. And I wrote a letter um, because I thought that they probably would. And so I wrote a letter with two very big names in vitamin D, Professor Reinhold Vieth from Canada and Professor Robert Heaney. Um, you'll see, ladies and gentlemen, I stopped short of saying what a dog's breakfast of a study that was. Um, I was a little bit politer and said fundamentally flawed study methodology, because the reason that I said that was because in his trial, he had an N of 12 in each group. And in the grant application that we had just written, I had done a lot of statistical analysis with our senior statistician, and we had calculated you needed a sample size of no less than 65. So he came back um, with an equally rebutted uh, statement to say, and you can see there, there uh, in, I don't know if I highlight this, yes, I do. Therefore, on the basis of all of these analyses, it can be concluded with a high degree of certainty that D2 is equally as effective as D3 at raising and maintaining vitamin D levels. The reviewers of the grant did indeed see it. And in fact, two of them wrote, that our grant application was now redundant because of the new Hollick study that showed conclusively that D2 and D3 are the same. I'm very pleased to say, ladies and gentlemen, that the grant panel were, I think, so impressed that we'd got our letter out in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition so quickly that they still gave us the money because they felt that it was going to be such an important question for the food industry. And so here we are, these are the results um, a few years on. So I show you here in the orange bar is D3, in the green bars is D2, and in the blue is placebo. We had a juice and a biscuit, so we changed the design uh, at the request of the panel because of the Hollick study. 
they said, let's not just do juice, let's do a solid food as well. So we did a juice and a biscuit. And you can see for yourselves that by that graph, that D3 was 50% better than D2 in raising and maintaining vitamin D levels. And in no way could you say that they were equally effective. And I honestly believe, ladies and gentlemen, that were it not for that UK funding, that we would still be saying that there was no difference. And this has been one of the most influential studies in vitamin D and indeed was the BBSRC put it in their strategic document to say it was a very good example of where doing research that's sort of relevant to the food industry. And we now have, um, and I don't have a slide because it literally only went up yesterday, but, and I was waiting to make sure that it's got up safely, but we've now done some very clever gene expression work of the difference between D2 and D3. And what our results seem to suggest is that actually, if you give D2, you may actually be making things worse. And perhaps I can come back to that in the questions. I think we probably need more data. But the bottom line is that if you can, take a D3 supplement, not a D2 one. And so just to, to finish off, just with a couple of slides on the practical applications or the practical ways of, of getting your vitamin D levels up. Eggs, sardines, fortified cereals, some fortified milks, not many in the United Kingdom, but certainly the dairy free uh, alternatives do have vitamin D um, added. Those are of course all D3 sources. Mushrooms are a source of D2. But um, the button mushrooms, as you see here, are grown in the dark. So if I have any mushroom lovers in the audience, then a very useful tip is to put your mushrooms when you're cooking them, April to September, or perhaps May to, to uh, end of August, um, given that you are, of course, in, in Glasgow, to put, if it's a sunny day, put your mushrooms on the windowsill and you will increase their vitamin D2 content. In the paper that we uh, wrote in the British Medical Journal, there is a beautiful summary of safe sunlight exposure to boost vitamin D status. And that was written by uh, the second author of the paper, Dr. Anne Webb, who is the prof uh, professor of atmospheric um, uh, environment at the University of Manchester. And indeed, actually did her PhD with Professor Mike Collins. So it's a, it's a small field, but she really knows her stuff. And the bottom line is that you need about 20 to 30 minutes of sunlight exposure without sun cream on. Your face, the backs of your hands, your neck, your arms will provide you with your vitamin D levels for the day and to try to do that on a daily basis so you keep your levels up. We've tried to, um, but I do have a, a Guardian podcast that I've done on vitamin D. And that captures everything that I've said here. And um, what we also would say is, of course, very early in lockdown, Public Health England published its new advice on vitamin D, which is, of course, 10 micrograms per day. And for that to be maintained during those winter months, um, you know, throughout time, we can maybe come back to whether you need to take it during the summer months. And of course, what was lovely to see was that the government have also provided free vitamin D pills for two and a half million vulnerable uh, individuals, uh, certainly in England. And I know that the Scottish government have done the same in Scotland. So to draw to a close to, to my uh, talk, I would just like to finish just with some final statements. Vitamin D is absolutely essential for bone and muscle health. That was born out in the American recommendation, in the UK recommendation. <clears throat> we do not have enough evidence, I think, certainly for COVID. And whilst we would like some more on acute respiratory and upper respiratory tract infections, I think we can now say that in some individuals that vitamin D may be beneficial. Many people have low vitamin D levels, especially if in the winter, or indeed if they are confined indoors, and of course during lockdown, that was a big issue during the summer. 
because of course summer sunshine is the main source of vitamin D for most people. And those government recommendations of 400 international units or 10 micrograms are, are particularly important um, and especially so if an individual is not getting out in that sunlight. And of course, what's also important to bear in mind is vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. And so that means it's stored in the body. And of course there is an issue of toxicity with vitamin D. And I'm very pleased to say that the UK, American and European panels all independently of one another agreed on the upper limit which is 4,000 international units per day or 100 micrograms. So what that means is that an individual can safely take 10 times the RNI, i.e. 10 times 400 international units per day and not have to be concerned about vitamin D toxicity. I think what I would say is to question why you're needing to take that much if you do, but you can certainly do it safely, but no more than that. And there have been you know, a huge amount in the, in the literature to say 10,000 international units, 50,000 international units per day, and that is just dangerous. And so please, please be careful what you read in the media. And those reports of SACN and NICE are you know, all available you know, on the website. I leave you with uh, just names. I won't read them all out in the interest of time, but we have a fantastic group at Surrey, you know, who we all work together on vitamin D and here are some of the names. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your attention. We have a lot of questions. And at the last count, there's 23 questions in the box. Uh, so I don't think we're going to get through them all, but we'll try and link a few of them together. I think, Sue, just to start, if we can, the, maybe just to nail once and for all, if we can, this question of vitamin D supplement, supplementation and acute respiratory infections. There seems to be some uncertainty as still um, about, first of all, well, one question saying Saturday's BMG editorial said vitamin D supplementation of 10 to 25 micrograms a day has a modest, modest protective effect against acute respiratory infections. But your final conclusion slide, if I understand it, didn't say that. Could you please comment? And with a similar question from a, an, another gentleman called Phil saying, disappointing there appears to be no causal link established between prophylactic use of vitamin D, um, especially given the possible link in BAME communities and their levels of vitamin D. It, if a good enough study were done, uh, could this link actually be, be proven once and for all? So what, what's the story? Well, thank you very much indeed. So I would say on the basis now, so that editorial, which I did see, I think is it, it we are now moving to, and indeed Sacken's um, final conclusion was from the, the new work that we have have done is that vitamin D may have a modest effect on re preventing acute respiratory tract infections. I think the problem that we have is that we don't have enough trials in developed countries. We do have more in developing. We don't have enough in, in affluent societies. But I would say that certainly of those trials that are there, that 10 to 25 micrograms which is what the Martinu study showed, does potentially have an effect on acute respiratory tract infections. I think certainly for BAIN groups, we just don't have the trial. The only trial that we have is, of course, in that American, Afro-Caribbean, Af African-American women, where actually getting them to 75 nanomoles per litre didn't prevent acute respiratory tract infections. But undoubtedly, you know, that is where we need to focus some more attention and to encourage in particular all population groups to take their vitamin D during the winter when they're going to be at risk of being low and particularly for those BAME groups because they are so vitamin D deficient. Um, 
Mo moving on, there, there are a, a number of questions uh, about the um, about taking vitamin D supplements, of course. Um, is there a difference between vitamin D from sunlight and from taking a supplement? Are they, are, are they both equally effective? Yes, they are. I mean, they will raise your vitamin D levels. Um, most, most certainly, I think where they're different is that your UV exposure um, source will mean that you cannot in any way become vitamin D toxic but your dietary source has the potential to, but uh, you know, you'd have to be at very high levels. So yes, so if you are able to get out in the sunlight with your about 10% of your body exposed, your face, your, your neck, the backs of your hands, your arms, if you're able to do that during the spring and the summer, then it may be that you don't need to take your vitamin D supplement because you're getting your UV from sunlight. The recommendation that we made from SACEN was because people are deficient during the, if we look at the national surveys, there are still a number of people who are vitamin D deficient during spring and summer. So that's why we recommend it all year round. But I would say to all of you, if you're able to get out and probably it, in, in Northern areas, you know, of in, in Scotland, it's probably more like May to end of August or more, May to the beginning of September, if you're able to get out, you wouldn't need to take that vitamin D supplement. But if you feel that you, when you go out, you're covered up, an old and aging skin will still make vitamin D um, as efficiently actually as a younger skin, but we just tend to go out more covered up. So if you are concerned, it won't do any harm to you to take that vitamin D supplement. Okay, yes. And, and, and carrying on just with the supplement theme, and is there any difference between taking vitamin D supplement weekly or daily? I think you actually covered that, but just a quick yes, response. That, that's a, I'm glad that's come up again. I would say that to take it daily, the large bolus doses, they don't seem to work either for prevention of acute respiratory tract infections, taking it daily 400 to a thousand international units per day is what the meta-analysis showed. So I would encourage you not to take it weekly, but to take it on a daily basis. Yes, I would encourage that. Right. Okay, and quite a number of questions about sunlight, of course. Again, just carrying on to the sunlight theme. Um, it, it, will a couple of weeks of winter sun in Spain in the winter be enough to boost vitamin D levels, presumably boost them adequately to, to cover you for the rest of the winter? It wouldn't boost you adequately. It would boost you a little bit. The half-life, so what that means is how long the vitamin D stays in the body is about 28 days. So you would achieve a boost to your vitamin D levels, but then it would still drop. Okay. And, uh, and the, the other side of that question, uh, can you make vitamin D on a cloudy day? Yes, you can. Some UV rays will still filter through. The more pollution that there is, that will certainly inhibit the UV rays. But on a cloudy day, you will still make a little bit of vitamin D, but obviously not as much as, as if the, the sun is, is stronger. No. But I guess, given the fact we have a lot more cloudy days and sunny days here, and if, if we're out in a cloudy day for an hour, does that compensate for 20 minutes in the sun? Oh, that's a very good question. And I would say, um, Professor Shankin, we don't have really <laughs> enough data to be that concrete. Not surprised. No. <laughs> it's so complex. And not only is it dependent on the cloud cover, but it's on an individual skin, you know, the amount of melatonin they have, the, how darker their skin is. There's so much variability to it. And, and also in terms of an individual, I, I didn't say that in my talk, but somebody with a higher BMI will have lower vitamin D levels. So again, you know, body composition is, is very important. So, you know, somebody who is, you know, um, overweight or obese, that is not good for their vitamin D health. Um, there are a couple of questions really to do with seasonal affective disorders. Um, this, uh, one, uh, maybe not specific to vitamin B, but I saw interior lighting systems claim to co combat seasonal affective disorders. 
do you have much experience with this and do artificial lighting products such as this actually have any benefit? And it's a very good... It, it's the same question really in relation to sunlight and seasonal affected disorders. It does. And sad, of course, you know, I think there has been now I'm straying into territory that I don't know anywhere near as much as I do the musculoskeletal health. But of the evidence that I've seen, there certainly seems to be an association, but there haven't been the, ran the strong randomized controlled trials. And of course, you know, we have to we have to apply the same rules in nutritional science as we do in every other science. And that is you know, is the science robust enough? And it is the randomized controlled trials that give us that robust data. And they just simply haven't been the randomized controlled trials in that disorder, but there certainly have been observations that people with SAD that do have lower vitamin D levels, and I would certainly encourage to take it. I think the jury is still out on, on the light. Thank you. Yes. Um... And another question, which is perhaps relates a bit more to Scotland, uh, just to whether reflection on snow can actually improve the um, uh, in, in winter, the, whether th this is actually beneficial in terms of vitamin D production. Do you know, that's an extremely good question. And I'm not sure that there's really been much science behind it. But what I would be guided by is the fact that you know, your skin will burn. And so there would be, because obviously there is a very strong correlation between the extent of tanning and the increase in vitamin D status that you have. So uh, that's a very good question. And I think I would need to look to see of the evidence of that. I don't think many people have done a study on it, but my guess is, is that it might be quite helpful, but I Maybe I can take that. And what I would say, Professor Schenken, if there are any questions that we don't get through, you know, people are very welcome to email me and I'll do my very best to, to answer that. I can easily be found at the University of Surrey. And certainly the person who's asked that snow question, I can certainly, well, the person who would know would be Professor Anne Webb. Um, what she doesn't know about UV light, um, no one knows. <laughs> it's not worth knowing. So that would be certainly a question I could ask her. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's certainly interesting when you see some of the postcards of people skiing and um, get often stripped to the waist or even more just to, yes. uh, it's true. to take, take advantage of the good weather you sometimes get. Um, <laughs> okay, um, question here, Tricia Fort. Uh, three years ago in March, and we're, we're on to blood tests. Um, my GP referred me to a consultant who referred, who requested, I, this was March, requested I have a blood test. It proved negative for the original concern. Consultant found my vitamin D count was low, recommended I take a vitamin daily. Was she correct? Could the result have been different if the test had been done in August? And am I right to take the vitamin all year round? I'm now 70. That's a very good, interesting question there. It would certainly probably have been different if you'd taken it in August. Um, because you would have March is when you've come to the end, at, you know, you're really at your lowest level for vitamin D, but she was absolutely right, A, to measure it, and B, to recommend a vitamin D supplement. You probably don't need to take it during those summer months, but if you're comfortable taking it, they're not expensive, of course, and if you're into the process, it's certainly not going to do you any harm to have that as well as some UV light. Yeah. Right, thank you. Some interesting questions here about vitamin D supplements, interactions with other medicines. Should people taking ACE inhibitors for hypertension take vitamin D supplements? Now, that's a very interesting one. Certainly for statins, there's been quite a lot uh, written um, with respect to the conflicting mechanisms and that statin users are very likely to require you know, a higher vitamin D intake. For ACE inhibitors, do you know what? I'm really not sure. And I think that that would be, it's a very good question. And rather than give an answer that I'm not 100% certain on, I think I would need to, to just take that away. My guess, mechanistically, potentially, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there's quite, quite, quite a number of other uh, questions about, about interactions with, with other drugs, which perhaps people should take up separately with, with you, because I think they, they're, they're a bit too personal. 
Um, uh, what, what, one uh, interesting one, which I would also want to know the answer to, th uh, thank you for the informative talk, is there a similar observation on the intake of multivitamins on COVID? Or have you only been looking at uh, vitamin D? Oh, well, now I've only been looking at vitamin D, but we, as a second panel, we've been looking at other nutrients. And very similar to vitamin D, I think there's no conclusive evidence yet. Uh, and let's hope, you know, that there are more studies coming out. Certainly zinc and selenium have been suggested to be important, but those are ob only observational trials. Those are not good randomized controlled trials. So I would say at the moment, just trying to consume a really healthy diet is, you know, is, is the best approach. Okay. Um, one or two questions, back to supplements again. Um, does it matter if vitamin D is taken through cod liver oil or through tablets? Um, no, it doesn't. Cod liver oil is a good source. The only thing I would say with cod liver oil, of course, is that it's very high in vitamin A. And, you know, there were some studies some time ago now, but looked at high levels, high intakes of vitamin A and showed a link with an increase in fracture uh, risk. So that would be the only caveat that actually, if you were to take a fish oil and a vitamin D supplement, you because of course the cod liver oil is extracted from the liver of the cod, so it's very high in vitamin A. And so that might not necessarily be something that you would want to be doing, particularly if you, you know, you consume vitamin A, high consuming, a high consuming diet. So maybe switch to fish oils and to a vitamin D supplement. But yes, certainly cod liver oil has been shown to be you know, very beneficial in terms of raising vitamin D levels. Right. Okay. Um, there's, there's a question from uh, Forrester Coburn, who's the uh, professor, uh, uh, former professor of paediatrics in, in child health in Glasgow, uh, pointing out that there's, that there's a lot of history in Glasgow, saying that uh, uh, Krishna Go uh, presented a Scottish Health Services Nutrition Survey of Immigrant Children in Glasgow in 1974 to 76 and then various other studies, just saying it's a very strong Scottish problem in particular, I think, given what you said earlier on in relation to um, the, the, the problems of vitamin D deficiency, especially in Scotland. Oh, thank you very much for that comment. And, and that is absolutely, you know, the case that, you know, those early studies were, were very important. And, and as you say, were, were based on, on children in, in, in your beautiful city. Okay, um, getting back to testing, is there a simple test you can take to establish vitamin D status or do you have to get a blood test and sent off to a specialist laboratory? I would encourage you all, there are kits that are sold, there are finger prick testings that are sold, I would be cautious with them. I think it is much better um, a laboratory that is through you know, a GP centre will be measuring vitamin D um, in the, with the most um, highly sophisticated methodologies. So it's likely to be what's called LCMS, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, which is the best measurement in the world. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to just be cautious of these home kits that you can buy. They really are not as validated as, as what they would purport them to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, getting back to one or two slightly more general questions perhaps. Why are the recommended levels so different between different countries? That's a very good question, and I can answer it in, in, a, in a very simple way. It's because the different countries have different criteria for setting their recommendations. So in the United Kingdom, we are our recommendations are for preventing deficiency, whereas, for example, America, its recommendations for nutrients are for optimising health. And that is why you, you will see differences in different levels. Right. Okay. Can I ask you questions who just, uh, a personal one which, which still surprised me. We used to have fortification of margarine with vitamin D for about 70 odd years. I mm -hmm. think it started immediately after the war. We, we fortified margarine with vitamin D 
And then just a few years ago, it was decided to stop fortification. What was, given where we are now, was that a good decision? And what you're, should we do about it? You're absolutely right. And I, I have tried to look into that, Alan, as to why we stopped that. When yellow fats were introduced, you're absolutely right. We put vitamin D in there. I, the only conclusion that I've been able to come to is that the vitamin D that was put in was so such a small amount. And if you look at the uh, 1954 British uh, birth cohort on the work that was undertaken by Professor Elena Hippenen, where she looked at margarine and non-margarine consumers and could find no difference in their vitamin D levels. So I think one of the reasons that it was taken out um, was because the levels were so small it virtually made no difference. But we certainly need to look at that going forward, because as I've shared with you, you know, we spend a huge amount of money on vitamin D supplements. If we could get more vitamin D fortified foods, that could be very beneficial, you know, to the population at large. Thank you. Uh, okay, what are your other more specific questions? Is there any connection between MS and vitamin D deficiency? There has been, and again, this isn't a field that I know terribly well, but certainly if you look at uh, the geographical um, uh, showings of MS, you know, across the, the scale, it does occur in populations where low vitamin D status is prominent. So certainly epidemiologically, it does stand up. But the randomized controlled trials as they currently stand, you know, have not shown, you know, a proven causal effect. But I think there's still an awful lot more research that we need to do on that. And I, I would say I'm not the best person placed to answer that because I've not studied that condition in, in a great amount, you know, of depth or detail. Yeah. And, and another one just... The, um, given the fact that you're also a national advisor on the National Osteoporosis Society, um, you've focused really only on vitamin D tonight, but are you concerned about calcium intake, especially given the trend towards veganism? Um, that's a very good question. The, the, I would say no, I'm not too concerned. When you look at our calcium intakes and the veganism, of course, is, you know, we have to be careful with veganism in terms of, you know, are all the different aspects covered? And I would say you can still get a calcium rich diet on a V, a calcium rich, you know, nutrient supply on a vegan diet. And if you look at the plant-based milks, there has been a great effort now to fortify them with calcium. Mm -hmm. um, they, the calcium is not naturally there as it is in cow's milk, it's added in, but soya milk, for example, you know, is equally bioavailable. We haven't done those studies, but the Omaha group in the USA have done all those comparative studies and they show that calcium absorption is as good from plant-based milks as what it is as from cow's milk. And of course, we still have, um, uh, Professor Schenkin, of course, what we still have is calcium in flour. And um, that was brought in, you know, in 1941 during the Second World War, and that still stays. And five years ago, as the second panel, we were asked by the food industry to relook at that, that calcium in flour, do we still need to do that by government law? And in younger populations, uh, flour-based products provide about 20 to 30% uh, percent of our calcium supply. So I would say I'm not so concerned, actually. I think as a nation, if you look at the levels, we, we are achieving a, a fairly a decent amount of calcium. Thank you. Thank you. And I think one final question, maybe taking back to the, this whole question of the media. Um, what was the object of the Indonesian doctors in planting such a biased report or, or on the benefits of vitamin D supplements? I mean, what, what, what do you think? Um, Fraud in science is so important and uh, trying try to understand how it happens, why it happens and how to detect it. That's a very good question. I think I don't think it was Indonesian doctors who put it there. The, the, they, those authors don't exist in any of those hospitals. 
I think, and I will, I can honestly say when we published our BMJ paper, our consensus paper, you would not believe the number of abusive emails that I got, um, hundreds of from people who have very firm views about vitamin D, who are making a lot of money from vitamin D. Okay. So I truly believe that actually it was planted not by doctors, but it was planted there to put the vitamin D in the spotlight from a profit point of view. Okay. Okay, I think that's uh, a nice controversial way to, to finish. So you've answered an enormous number of questions, given us a, a terrific talk. And uh, I'd now like to hand over to uh, Professor Pat Monaghan, who will give the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. Um, Susan, uh, it falls to me now to both thank you uh, for your talk and to present you with the Graham Medal, which you can see a picture of behind me here. Uh, don't worry, it's not that size, uh, so, <laughs> uh, and it, it will come to you uh, in the post, but I'll come to that in a moment. Um, I first, on behalf of the society and its members and everybody who's been listening uh, this evening, I'd like to really thank you for what has been an extremely informative, uh, up-to-date and honest talk about vitamin D, uh, a science-based and evidence-based talk, which is very important. And it's also very important that the talk was coming from someone with a very high level of expertise in the subject area. You emphasized in your talk uh, the need to be very wary of fake science, um, to be very wary of so even scientific information which has not yet been subjected to scrutiny. And that scrutiny, the public can't do that, it has to come from other scientists. And that's a problem for the public. Where do they get reliable information from? And, and people need to be very, you emphasize a number of times of that very important issue of be careful where you get your information from. Um, so thank you very much for all of that. Also, thank you for your tips about what to do with your mushrooms. I think we'll all be having <laughs> mushrooms lined up on our windowsills. And we'll also be waltzing around uh, with our, our arms bare and maybe in some cases our torsos bare. We have a, a phrase in Glasgow, taps af, it's called, which is take your top off in sunny weather. <laughs> so taps off then as soon as possible, at least for some, maybe not for the women listening. Um, so thank you very much indeed. It was a pleasure to listen to you. Um, I'm very sorry indeed that uh, I'm not able to hand uh, the medal over to you on behalf of the society. I. Um, I, I think I'm shortly to become the, the next president, and that would have been one of my duties, would have been to give you the medal. The best I can do is this picture behind me. It's the engraved medal. It has your name along the bottom here, uh, and it will arrive in the post. So a wholehearted thanks uh, to you from all of us. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'm, I'm very honoured. Thank you very much.